Good morning, everybody. Um, we have only already heard a few things um, around tag PDF PDFA. I'm, I'm going to go into that a bit, a bit more. Um, the, the reason I'm oh, actually let me yeah. So that's the overview of my talk. Um, get rid of this one here. Um, I'll briefly uh, say who I am and why I'm here. Um, I'll say a few words about uh, PDFUA as such. Um, I will do some demos to help you understand uh, why PDFUA might be relevant uh, to certain user groups. Uh, I'll briefly speak about uh, what, what's in the PDFUA standard, what are the roles that it establishes. Um, I'll also point you to a resource that might prove valuable if you want to dive deeper into the technicalities uh, of PDFUA and uh, briefly look at what might be coming in the future. Um, the, actually, the reason I'm here goes back to Ross. We've been in touch uh, for the last two years or so, I believe, because we share some interest in, in making uh, PDF more accessible also in the field of mathematics. Uh, I'm happy to have finally have met him here during this conference. Uh, and I also appreciate the invitation to be able to speak here. Um, I happen to be the chairman of the PDF station and the International Trade Association dealing in all things PDF. Um, I also have to make some money on this side. I'm uh, the CEO of two small companies in Berlin, Germany, developing PDF technology and uh, technology for editorial workflows and magazines and that kind of stuff. Um, I also have been involved in the development of all PDF rated standards since 1999 as a German delegate to ISO. Uh, I also happen to have some other interests like color and color science. Uh, I'm the chairman of the European Color Initiative. And I also, like 13, 14 years back, uh, participated in writing a book about PostgreSQL PDF. Uh, that was a very challenging time to, to get that done. Um, but let's get to, to PDF UA. Just trying to make sure this doesn't fall down. Um, so the philosophy behind PDF UA 2, PDF UA, uh, PDF UA uh, is a, an international standard by, by ISO, published in uh, 2012 for the first time, just revised last year, fixing a few minor issues. Um, and it addresses um, universal access to content in PDF files. And the philosophy behind that is um, to provide reasonable access to whatever is there. It does not guarantee that what is there is good. So it makes crap as accessible as good content. It's important to understand. Yeah. Um, it doesn't try to fix everything in the world, just offering access to whatever is inside a PDF document. Um, and one very essential rule is you could put anything inside a PDF, but you must always make sure that it either is taxed or is also represented as taxed to help with machine-based access to the content. So, and, and that's what it actually tries to do in, in, in the way it goes about it. Um, it provides an interface for machines, surprisingly, to all content in PDF in a semantic fashion. Uh, and it leaves the way how that machine accessible content is delivered to a user, to the consuming technology. It doesn't try to establish all kinds of rules how a screen reader or screen magnifier or some other tool must go about its job. It leaves this intentionally open, but it, it enables such machine-based access to content PDF files. Um, what's also important, uh, while it does focus on, on the uh, file format, it does have a couple of rules on readers and assistive technologies that want to claim themselves PDF UA conforming. And in essence, it tries to say, well, if, if you're a PDF-consuming uh, tool, you must use the possibilities provided by PDF UI and make them accessible to a user. Um, there's a bit of history behind that. It all goes back to the first half of the 2000 years. Um, it was, the work on PDF UI was initiated by AIM, uh, an American trade station dealing in records management, information management. Uh, the standardization work, standardization work was carried out in ISO TC171 SC2, um, and as I mentioned, it was first published in 2012. Uh, it was also very important since then, um, quite a number of vendors, big ones as, as much as, as quite a few small ones, have started developing tools and technologies to help people actually create and use 
uh, PDF UA. Um, I'm trying to do a few quick demos, and it's always a challenge to do a demo, um, but I'll try it anyway. Um, and uh, I have to hook up a speaker here just to make sure you can hear well what's coming out of this machine. Let me see. Um, who of you? That's just telling me it's on. <laughs> <laughs> who of you has some understanding of tech PDF? Okay, quite a few. Uh, who has uh, some understanding of a screen reader? Okay, so good. I'll help the rest of you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I need an assistive technology as well. Um, so what I'm going to do here briefly is um, to, to show you how uh, a blind person might be using uh, a tag PDF and take advantage of what's inside. Uh, yeah. so this is a, is a flyer uh, for a conference the PDF Association did in 2013. And I need to turn up the volume. Okay. And uh, it is a small document, but it's already relatively complex because uh, the, the, the content starts like on the upper right of, of the page, so you couldn't easily guess where to start if you wanted to do it on based on heuristics. So it's actually giving you some instructions in German because it's a German Windows system I'm running here, but it's kind of telling you that it's, it's a heading level one, it was just speaking out which is the title of this flyer. Um, now, the, the text-to-speech portion is just one portion of what the screen reader and some other tools do. So they, they can speak out text to people who can't see. They, they can also send text to a braille display, a line of knobs that go up and down so you can feel them uh, and, and read them uh, using your fingers. Um, but that's not even the most important one, that it can kind of convert the, the text representation into something spoken or, or uh, shown on a braille display. What's as important is that it help, lets you navigate through the document. So I can use something like the letter H to jump to the next heading. Light at my conference program Tuesday, June 18, 2013. Lush, at my. It's speaking the, the, the heading at uh, the, the first half on the, uh, of the table. And conference it, program Wednesday, June 19, 2013. Lush, at, light at, Lush, at my. Now it jumps back to the like, first page in the PFI code. This is a flyer <laughs> and it gets folded in a certain fashion. Uh, so using keyboard, com keyboard commands, I can jump around the document very easily. I can, I can go to images, for example. I can go to tables, to lists, and so forth. This is very important. and th This makes it obvious that it's not enough to just have some text that can be spoken. And it's not sufficient that the text is in the right order. It's also important that you have additional semantic and structural information, like landmarks in the document, so to speak, that allow you to uh, navigate around, especially if the document is slightly longer than one or two pages. Yeah, if you want to read a book, uh, you don't want to go through it sequentially and just hope you run to the content of interest at some point of time. Um, so, let me just get rid of this text-to-speech. Um, there's one other thing, uh, and that's kind of, might be useful to do for, for, for those of you who want to, to do something with tag PDF or around tag PDF. Um, there's a tool called PDF Accessibility Checker. Um, it's a diagnostic tool, it's not an end user tool. Um, and it allows you to check uh, to which degree a tag PDF file is actually conforming with the PDF UA standard. Um, and I'm just sending the document, which one was it, that I was just showing. I'll have to pick another one. Um, it, it can uh, check the quality of a, a tag PDF file and give you some information how, how good or how bad it is. This one is uh, relatively good. It gives you all kinds of green uh, check marks. But that's not even the most important point here. Um, there's something called Screen Reader Preview. And this gives you a very useful 
structural view of the contents inside your PDF file. So it doesn't use the visual presentation you would get from Adobe Acrobat uh, Reader or something like that, or if you print the document out, but an abs abstraction of the content based on the tagging information. Uh, so you see the, the, the order of the content. You would read, if, if you use text-to-speech, you would read it in this fashion. Um, but you see also the markup, like the headings, H1 and so forth, the P for paragraph and, and L for lists and, and so on. You will recognize most of the stuff if you, if you have ever looked at HTML code. Uh, and I think the, the inner workings of this uh, are already obvious. You'll also get information that is normally not printed, like the alt entry for the alternative description for an image is just printing. Uh, shown as, as, uh, as part of the presentation here. This is very important if you want to double check um, kind of the inner, inner structure of a tag PDF file you have and you might be working on. Um, all the tools I'm showing here are free of charge. You don't have to pay for them. You can grab them and, and download them from the internet. Um, and I think that can be very useful if you want to do work in this, uh, in this field. Um, I want to show you a third tool it's called VIP PDF Reader. Um, it's a tool for people with low vision, so people who see something but not that well. Um, and I'm using the same flyer I was just using in the screen reader and then opening it here. And you see yet another way to present it. Uh, people with low vision often only can see certain color combinations well and don't see others well or they have strain on their eyes if, if they have to look at black and white or white and black. Um, and uh, they also need magnification. And of course you could just magnify an Adobe Reader, Acrobat Reader, but you, then you magnify the page and you get a big page and you have to find your way on the page. Uh, sometimes it's nicer to just focus on the text as such and then make it as big as you want to have it, um, and it could make it bigger than it is here already using a couple of, of settings, and then just go through this text. And for some people, this might be um, a way um, how they could still uh, read the text using their eyes. And it's, still, it's very important for such people that they can do that, as opposed to having to rely on text-to-speech. Um, and again, what's very important, it's not just the text. I could use uh, similar keyboard shortcuts I, I was using in, in NVDA and jump from heading to heading, right? Or from table to table. And because the table is possibly very complex, you can't easily show it in, in, in that magnification on the screen. Um, so uh, using another keyboard shortcut, um, I could go into the table and it does as good as a job as it can to make the text big and still show the table structure and allow me to move around in the table. So again, tag PDF and accessibility, this is not just for blind people, it's for all kinds of people. This could, this could be useful for somebody with a mobility issue who can't easily move their hands or, or whatever, and, and they might use special tools to get around, move around in a, in a PDF file uh, and then get to the content they, they care about. Um, and last but not least, I wanted to show something that picks up what Ross was was already um, discussing. Uh, it may actually look familiar, at least to Ross, and probably to you as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, this is a piece that was provided to me by Ross. Uh, it, it's a very well-designed tag PDF file. There's some interesting additional bits and pieces because the, the formulas are actually uh, internally represented in a structure that is equivalent to MathML. So officially, tag PDF doesn't know MathML yet. This will only be the case in the next version. But it, P, tag PDF doesn't block you from using those um, tags anyway, and they are just custom tags in that case, and you already have to have prior knowledge uh, to understand they are MathML tags. Uh, but you can do that. And using a prototypical uh, feature that's unfortunately not uh, publicly available yet because we haven't quite finished the work, um, you can get to that in an interesting fashion. Okay. So it's, it's a feature we call Easy Reader, uh, but it's more or less just a working title. And it, it, it grabs the information that's encoded in this PDF file and allows you to walk through it. Again, it uses certain keyboard commands, similar to the ones I've shown. And using Control F, I could jump to the next formula. Um, and it will uh, 
show me in, in text form the representation that I can extract from the formula at that point. Uh, I could actually speak it. Formula. K element of double struck capital R. Uh, and move around and um, let me get to something more interesting. <clears throat> So this is a, it's, not, it's probably not complex for mathematicians, but it's complex for me already. This is the expression. Um, um, I, I only did math at, at school, so I never went to university and did math there. Um, but it, it's very difficult to just speak it out because it's, it would be a relatively long text already. Um, and if, if you get lost, like in the middle of the, 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 the concept being spoken as text, uh, you may have to start over from, from, from the start and it's just not, not very useful. Um, so what this tool does, it gives you access to the structure. So I can enter into the formula um, and then just move around in its pieces. Yeah? And again, if some of the pieces are still relatively complex, I could, I could ask the tool what they are. Um, Row element with four elements. The element with number two is currently selected. Yeah, so that's the structural description. Left curly bracket element of type table. So it only says t there's a table. Because it's a table, it doesn't speak the whole table because they tend to get complex. But I could go inside the table and, and then look at that. And then becomes more manageable. And I could ask the tool to, to speak that X to X minus sine 2Y plus Z minus sine 4W. Uh, and then go on. And this makes it obviously possible to look at one piece at a time to establish a mental model of what I have in front of me, because I can also ask... Um, Element of type table. So if I'm, I've forgotten where I am, I could ask the tool, where am I? And it's telling, you, telling me I'm inside a table. And then I could ask what kind of table, which cell I'm looking at, and so forth. Um, and this all becomes possible because, in this case, presentation MathML tags are used inside the tag PDF to encode the pieces of the formula. So it's an alternate approach to what Ross was just showing. What Ross was showing just a few minutes ago was something that would work just in plain Adobe Reader or similar tools. This needs a special tool, but it gives you also added flexibility and, and more refined access to the internal structure of uh, formula. Do you say formula or formulas? <laughs> Formulae, OK. So the Latin way. Uh, <laughs> OK, so I think you get the picture. And there are all kinds of other things you can do um, uh, with tag PDF and then taking advantage of uh, what's inside it. Um, so how, how does PDF UA go about achieving that? Um, and it's not, it's not necessarily rocket science. Um, it, it, it establishes a bunch of rules what you have to do to produce a decent tag PDF that can call itself universally accessible. Uh, so that the basics, the fonts must be embedded. If you don't have the proper fonts, the rendering might not look very good. Color must be clearly defined. Uh, if orange and, and red get too, too similar to each other, you might not be able to distinguish one from the other anymore, and so forth. As I said already, everything must be there as text. And that means Unicode, like pro proper text, properly encoded, and so on. Um, it can go, easily go wrong, and you have to get it right for, for tag PDF. And for anything that's not a text already, a picture, maybe an audio, uh, em embedded audio file, and, and so on, you must have a text-based equivalent. Um, reading order must be clearly defined. You must be able to extract from the, from the syntax in the PDF, not from looking at a page on screen, where the content starts, where it continues, where it ends. Um, you must assign semantic roles, headings, paragraphs, lists, and tables. Um, it's, it's not that many tags, actually, that you can use in PDF. They're, they're pretty basic in, in, in most cases. So headings are the most important ones because they are the main landmarks in a less than trivial, uh, non-trivial document. Um, and then some complex structures like lists and table, tables have to be set up uh, properly. Um, and you must make sure that the logical structure you have in, in, in this way in the PDF file matches the content structure. Um, there are some uh, minimal requirements for metadata. You must have a document title. Um, you must not use certain showstoppers or blockers. Uh, if you're not allowed to use encryption and prohibit access to content. You can do this with using encryption, but it's not allowed for PDF UA. And so forth. Lots of small bits and pieces. Um, 
One question arises often, so what's different between tag PDF as we know it? It was invented in 2001 as part of PDF 1.4 and still is present in PDF 1.7, the current version of PDF. Um, the problem with tag PDF and, and, and the PDF specification is it's a bit open-ended in some parts of it. So you can do certain things, but it doesn't tell you you have to do it, and sometimes it even doesn't, doesn't tell you exactly how to do certain things. Uh, it was at that time in 2001. It was more a description of what Adobe Acrobat uh, 5 at that time was doing, rather than a, a normative document uh, setting up roles. Um, so anyway, PDF UA is the answer to the question: What does a well tag PDF look like? Uh, there are also tag PDFs, valid tag PDFs that are not well tagged. They would not count or could never count as PDF UA. Um, if you want to know a bit more about the technical details of these rules in, in the PDF UI standard, you could either go to ISO and, and buy the standard, it's around 80 Swiss francs, francs or something like that. Uh, it's pretty dry matter. Uh, if you have difficulty falling asleep in the, in the night, it's a good remedy. Um, it's also very, very dense. So it's, it's, uh, you already have to know a lot to really find uh, the PDF UI standard useful. And you will have to read the 900 something pages of PDF 1.7 anyway. Uh, so, um, it might be easier to, to look at the Matterhorn protocol. That's a document that was developed by the PDF Association uh, last year um, that took the PDF UI standard and translated it into checkpoints. So, for each and every bit in the PDF UI standard, it tried to express it as something that you can actually <coughs> check. And that also implies that it might be easier to understand what that checkpoint or what that rule in PDF UI is about. Um, it's still a very technical and dry document, but less dry uh, than the PDF UI standard proper. And it has one advantage, it's available free of charge. Um, and it has uh, 136 <coughs> failure conditions in uh, 31 checkpoints. And the, the 31 checkpoints that are listed here uh, are, um, uh, more or less match uh, clauses in the PDF UI standard. So there is more or less a one-to-one -one mapping between clauses in, in, in the standard and checkpoints and the failure conditions in the checkpoints in the Matterhorn protocol. So if, you, if you're interested in that, it's a free download from the PDF station. And it has also become the point of reference for most uh, implementations of PDF UA that either uh, check against the standard, like the PDF accessibility checker I was using is developed re directly against the Matterhorn protocol. And the developer behind it was part of the Matterhorn team. Uh, and it's also used by other people who are writing software to produce or consume uh, PDF UI documents. Um, so what's at the horizon? Um, the better is the enemy of the good. I think PDF UI is very good, but it could still be better. Uh, and we are working on that. So ISO is working on um, the foundation for PDF UI, which is PDF proper. That would be ISO 32000-2 or PDF 2.0. Uh, we've been working on it for six or seven years, I believe, seven years by now. Um, it's, it's really a very, very uh, long document. It's around 1,000 pages. Um, and we have invested a lot of effort to also improve the foundation for PDF UA uh, in the form of tag PDF. And the whole tag PDF chapter was rewritten. Uh, by me, actually. Uh, I lost uh, a couple of weeks of my, <laughs> my personal uh, leisure time working on that. Um, and it added to my gray hair. But I felt it was necessary because I didn't like the way it was written uh, so far. Uh, and it was substantially proved also with the help, of course, with, of uh, all the other experts in, in the ISO committee. Um, and it introduces a couple of interesting things. For one, uh, it introduces MathML as a, as a built-in tag set. And that goes back, in the end, to Neil Seufer, when one of the inventors behind MathML, uh, and a couple of other people. And it allows for namespaces. That makes it possible for namespaces for tags. And that makes it possible to establish other tag languages. And you could look at ChemML or some other markup language and pick that up and use it inside uh, PDF 2.0. And PDF UA itself will also be uh, developed further and updated. Um, and it should actually say 14289-2 here. Um, 
It will be based on PDF 2.0. It will take advantage of the new possibilities in uh, PDF 2.0 and uh, will fix some of its own issues. We have found out that certain rules in PDF UI are, not, are so impractical that they become detrimental to the adoption of PDF UI that will be fixed. Um, and uh, a few other new ideas will be incorporated. Um, for any, any further reading and researching you might want to do, um, there's one booklet and I have printed copies here. Um, PDF UI in a nutshell, it's a 16 page uh, brochure um, and it kind of gives you the overview. Um, I think it's, it's relatively light reading compared to, to Matterhorn protocol. Um, and if you really want to just grab the idea and understand some of the implications, it, it's good reading. For the technical details, the Matterhorn protocol is the best starting point. Uh, it will force you to, to look at the various technical implications. Um, if, you, if you have already looked at TechPDF, you, but you never quite got it, uh, which was true for me like, like 10 years back, um, there's a very good uh, presentation by Matthew Hardy, uh, an Adobe employee, called Entangled in the Tech PDF Jungle, which was held uh, two years ago uh, at the technical conference of the PDF station. And I think that's, if you spend 45 minutes watching that video recording, it's available on YouTube, uh, that will kind of get you going with how Tag PDF works. Um, if you want to find out stuff or find out what other people are uh, thinking about, there's a pretty decent discussion forum on LinkedIn uh, around PDF UA. Uh, I mentioned the tools um, and, and was showing them already. Um, if you really are kind of into Tag PDF and PDF UA and want to get closer to the action, so to speak, you could just consider become a member. And we may actually want to discuss off. Uh, of, of protocol or of the, of the meeting, uh, but that might make sense to establish a liaison between your accessibility group, especially if they are looking into accessibility in PDF from going from starting from TAG uh, and the PDF station. Just an idea. Which brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope it was useful <coughs> somehow. Uh, I could spend a few more hours getting into all the details. Uh, please feel free to, to grab me. I'm here all day in, in, the, in the evening. Um, yeah. All right. We've got about five Thanks. minutes for questions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Had to be. <laughs> um, that um, free accessibility checker, how does that compare with what's in Acrobat Reader? Okay. Acrobat so there's an accessibility checker in, in Acrobat Pro, it has been for a couple of years. Um, I would say it's somehow limited and it's definitely not up to the task of checking PDF UA. So the PDF Accessibility Checker 2, which came out last year with a lot of sponsoring from, from various organizations, um, re is really doing all the checks a piece of software could do against the PDF UA standard. It's complete. Uh, it's, it's been approved by the expert community around this. Um, and, and just to make that point, the PDF Accessibility Checker, as much as any other checker, uh, is just a piece of software. It can only check things that software can check. It can never or hardly ever find out whether you're using the right heading tag on a certain piece of text or whether you're using a paragraph text and should have been using something else. Uh, it also cannot detect what, the, what, what a meaningful sequence of content is that, that is right. You will have to find this out by inspection using the screen reader preview or some other tools that give you a, 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 an abstract representation of the content. And that's as much as uh, important as checking the, the syntax stuff. So never forget, forget that, it's, it's really important. The only person who actually cares about what's in on that paper, or the person who writes it and the people who read it, how do you get the person who writes it to care enough to put in something you can be translated properly. Yeah. So um, what's, what has driven PDF UA and what's driving some of the work I and some other people are doing is that we should arrive at a state where the author doesn't have to do extra work, 
but just, just has to use the tools they are using in the right fashion. In a perfect world, and I speak about Microsoft Word in this case because it's used by some authors in the field, in a perfect world, Microsoft Word would allow you to enter an equation, and as opposed to a screenshot of an equation, but an equation <laughs> <laughs> happens all the time. Um, and, and actually, Word does have a math editor. I don't know how good it is, but it does have one. And you could use something from Design Science to have a better math editor. So you just do what you do anyway. Maybe you have, you have the equation around already, because they tend to be around. They, they, they don't invent equations all the time. So you grab a good representation of your equation, maybe in MathML. You insert it in Microsoft Word. And it will look right, because Word doesn't know how to lay out it properly. Uh, maybe you add some annotations, something like that. I'm speaking about perfect world, not, not our world. Uh, <laughs> and then on the exporting the PDF file to tag PDF, which you can do in principle in Word, you can export the tag PDF file, but it will fail on, on equations and formula. We'll just make an image and put an alt tag around it, if, if you're lucky. But if it did the right job, it would create a tag PDF file with the exact same inner structuring that Ross has been able to inject with a lot of work, I guess, uh, starting in this case from, from tag or, yeah. So, and stuff is happening. So my, my company is working on something to create a PDF from HTML, and we, we, want, we are about to, to, to maintain MathML that might be present in HTML and just inject it into the resulting PDF file. Uh, there's something going on for, for uh, Adobe InDesign, the most widely used uh, professional layout tool in the industry. People like Ross are working on stuff in, 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 the, in the tech uh, context. So I hope sufficient progress is made in the next one, two, three, four, five years so that you only have to tell authors, please grab your um, MathML or maybe La uh, there's LaTeX Math and stuff like that and ASCII Math, whatever. And it doesn't matter because you can convert one into the other. Just grab that, stick it in this dialog box or in this field in your authoring environment, and just leave it alone. And then the tool will make sure it ends up in the exported tag PDF. That's the goal that we have. Did I understand your response to Ross that PDF accessibility checker is more thorough yeah. than Yeah. Is it, I saw you running it in Windows. Is it available for any other OS? Unfortunately, only Windows at this time. If you feel like sponsoring it, <laughs> join a few other people who are about to, to find it. The next, uh, next version would be for Mac. If you were looking for Linux or... No, I, Mac is good. good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think with the upcoming virtualization tools, it should become easier to run it as a... As a uh, yeah. All right, one more question. PDF, I'm talking about PDF as a format being accessible to developers. It's a different thing. So the PDF had an uh, extension called Mars. Okay. Uh, it was more accessible than the SVG. Okay, so. What happened? So for those who, who knows what Mars is or was? Okay. So Mars was the response from Adobe to XPS from Microsoft. Uh, around 2007, I believe, Microsoft came out with this XPS, Extensible Printing Structure. What pr I don't know exactly what that means. It was about, it was about printing. Um, <laughs> and it was, they wanted to get rid of GDI. They're still fight, struggling. Um, so they created an XML-based uh, representation of print content, which will have to be page-oriented, so it was similar to what PDF is doing. Um, and because XML was a big hype, and maybe it still is a big hype, uh, and of course people were saying, well, PDF is not accessible, we need an XML version of PDF so we can access the content more easily. And then we said, well, okay, we do it. So they, 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 they developed a syntax where you could transcode a PDF file into an XML representation. And it worked. I think on Windows you could still save as XML PDF. I don't know. Maybe you have to download the Mars plugin. Mars is the the code name for the project. Um, and it turns out you got, you got everything if you just do it. The files were bigger, took much longer to pass them, took much longer to write them. You could get as much out of them as out of an ordinary PDF file. Because it was still the same 
inner syntax, so to speak. Just because you write XML pointed brackets, you don't get much. And it still had like resource structure and content stream and complex font dictionaries and so on. So the complexity was still the same. And to be honest, I don't think you get anything out of that by just writing it down in XML. Um, the only thing to, to, to get further, if you wanted to get rid of certain things in PDF, you would have to invent it again and in starting from XML from step one and not just transcoding it into a questionable XML representation. So I, it can be done, it works, uh, but it doesn't give you much from my point of view. And I think there's, there hasn't been really any success in, in Mars. It didn't cost extra, but people still st did not start using it. You would be using, but if you see here, you do all this time using that kind of Yeah, I think you can have it in the PDF structure uh, and you can kind of bring together the, the focus on presentation because PDF is first about presentation, nice presentation, nice looking presentation, yeah? And control of, about, about presentations. You can decide that this piece goes in the upper right corner of the page and not somewhere else. Um, at the same time, you're able using uh, logical structure in tag PDF to, to mark up or tag the, the visually presented content in, in the fashion that it becomes very similar to what you would have in XML or HTML or any other such markup language. <coughs> but you have to put it there. All right, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you.